can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal with lies. Hey everybody, welcome back. Thought we'd have a chat about immigration today. What fun, right? I mean, this isn't an issue which, you know, anybody seems to really have staked positions on. It should be a nice, easy sort of uh, topic to cover without any ruffling any feathers. Eh, probably not. So, this is an interesting issue to me, and one I've actually been thinking about for a long time. Not only because I spent long enough time vested on a singular side who was paying me to promote specific goals, but also because it does seem to be one of these football issues, the kind of things people punt around and throw back and forth at each other. And the more you watch the debates and the arguments and the discussions on the topics of immigration, the more we seem to repeatedly find ourselves, such as with most issues, oftentimes confronted almost solely with two polar opposite sides, both of which usually seem to rely more on emotional appeals or sentiment, than actual argument and logic and thought. Now, on the one hand, in this immigration debate, and I'm speaking about the fringes here, I understand, but on, the, on these fringes, when it comes to immigration, we always seem to have two sides. One side that feels that we should just have open borders, a one-world government of some kind where people can freely move wherever they like, whenever they like, for any reason, and um, no, no need to assimilate or anything like that, and if people want to bring their own cultures, no matter how backwards or barbaric they may be, that they should be just welcomed and ingratiated into whatever lands that they move into, regardless of cultural differences. This is very naturally and quite obviously a stupid idea. At the same time, though, and this is more specifically here in the U.S., which is what the focus of this video is going to be, American immigration, but on the uh, other side of this, we always seem to find the same sort of drivel coming out about we need to round them all up and deport them, right? We need to lock down that border, build that wall, etc., etc., etc. Now, these people are oftentimes speaking from a very nationalistic sense, which is rather obvious to anyone who listens to them. But at the same time, it's also not so much rooted in a robust understanding of what the issue actually is, as much as more emotionally laden garbage. Now, between these two polar opposites and throughout the spectrum of opinions which exists within, we do find a varying degree or set of degrees in respect to how people approach the issue. Some people are very anti-immigrant but have an understanding of the reality that there's really no stopping them. Other people, meanwhile, are very pro-immigrant, yet also do hold to the notion that movement into and out of a certain country in such a way as mass immigration does need control. It needs management, otherwise everything's going to get fucked up and nothing's going to work. But one thing I find, and this is what I've been finding interesting, one thing that I find oftentimes goes unaddressed is the people themselves, the immigrants, and not just the immigrants, but also their motivations. Now, I'm not speaking strictly in the sense of we need to think about what it's like for them, although we kind of do. Now, as I said before, those polar opposite sides, the, the, the super pro-immigration, we need to bring every other culture here and let them replace ours, versus the super anti-immigration people, which can range from your alt-right crackpots who believe in an ethno-state, just down through your simple hardline nationalists who don't think anybody who wasn't born here belongs here. Between these two, we will sometimes hear about the people and the motivations. Now, if it's from the ultra-nationalist, hard-right, anti-immigrant side, usually this opinion is one that these immigrants are just coming here to mooch on our benefits and to steal and rob and rape and kill, and they're all murderers and rapists. And, Ooh, are you scared yet? And then on the other side, too, the, the uh, more progressive open-worlders, they always like to invoke the notion of people and their situations and motivations, but they never really seem to explore them or actually factor in what they actually are. They just want to use, you, you pull on your emotional heartstrings to sort of manipulate your emotions however they can. Look at this poor child! Now, you can't look at this child and say that this child is a good reason to allow any old guy between the ages of 18 and 35 to come through without any paperwork at all, do whatever they like, then you're a terrible racist person, right? 
Now, what I don't hear, and this is really what I wanted to express, what I don't hear in these discussions about immigration is the actual levels of motivation, personal motivation, that are behind each and every one of these illegal immigrants. Now, those who are emigrating legally, their desires to move from wherever it is they're from to a place like the United States with its prosperity and its purported liberties, you can see with the amount of shit they go through to get here, the paperwork, the bureaucracy, the waiting periods, the filings, the testings, all of that, you can see that this is something that they truly and desperately want and they will not take no for an answer. They're going to get what they're after. And that's admirable. Frankly, if I was running a country, I'd want determined, capable people. But at the same time, the illegal immigrants' motivations is seldom really thought out or discussed. Now, this first came to my mind ages ago when I was working in a pizza kitchen on the border of Massachusetts down in a town called Salem. The place is called Bertucci's. Nice brick oven pizzeria. Um, really fantastic food. And most of the kitchen staff, I'd say probably about 90-95% of the kitchen staff actually were Spanish speakers, um, native Spanish speakers. Two Puerto Ricans, I believe, uh, two Puerto Ricans, one Brazilian, who you know, naturally spoke Portuguese, but his Spanish was pretty good, and, a, uh, and um, the rest were Dominican. Now, I got on great with these fellas, and what I also discovered was, too, at the time, most of them were actually undocumented or flat-out illegal. Now, when it came to the one Brazilian we had, I got a very interesting story about what his trek was to get to the U.S. to take a job in a kitchen for about $9 an hour, cooking pizza and pasta for back-to-school shoppers. You know? He came from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Now, if you've ever seen the film City of God, you know that Sao Paulo is pretty much an entrepreneurial shooting rink. Uh, there's not really much in the way of law and order, and what little there is is corrupt as fuck. It's a violent, dirty, but it, some would say in some ways wonderful, I guess, place. But it is the kind of place you can understand someone wanting to get out. Now, when this friend, this colleague and co-worker of mine was describing what it took him to get out, it was a rather eye-opening story. It was effectively walking and hitchhiking from Sao Paulo out of Brazil and up through the other countries of Central America, including Venezuela and I believe Colombia. His winding route took him through very many dangerous spots in which everything from bandits to corrupt entrepreneurial police all threatened his life and livelihood at every step of the way. Then finally getting to the southern border of Mexico after crossing through, cent after crossing through Central America, he got to the southern Mexican border where, it, oh boy, if you think our southern border is sort of a hot and hostile place with not too much love or affection for our southern neighbors or something like that, you should see what Mexico's southern border is like. Not too welcoming as South Americans. Now, as he continued making his way up and he made his way through Mexico where he was genuinely just, uh, well, disliked, he made his way illegally across the border with the help of a coyote. That's a term for somebody who smuggles people across the border. And then once in Texas, climbed into a cattle truck where he was driven from Texas several thousand miles to Boston. And when he got to Boston, the grand, uh, grand life awaiting him there, that which he came to steal from good, hard-working Americans, well, that life turned out to be uh, living in a two- or three-bedroom apartment with, I believe, eight or nine other people, and then getting a ride into a pizza kitchen, where, as I said before, he would cook pizzas daily for back-to-school shoppers and mall shoppers for less than $10 an hour. Now, in considering this story which I just laid out for you, and the thousands upon thousands of other similar stories which come across the border, I suppose, each year, it is important to step back and to take stock of what that really means. All the risks this individual ran, all the dangers he faced, all the difficulty he went through just to get here, just to cook pizza in the mall, and to do it diligently and to typically not complain about it at all. But everything that he went through to get here. Now, if he was to suddenly be deported and kicked back to Brazil, what, what exactly do you think he would do next? Do you think he would just sort of, well, tuck tail and run? Do you think he'd just sort of lick his wounds and accept his punishment and say, well, they're right, law is the law? Or would he say, fuck this place, I'm not staying here, I'm going back again? Now, aside from the questions of how much money we want to waste, over and over and over again, rounding people up and sh sending them off and then enforcing and defending a border uh, in the ways that people like to think. How much effort on 
our part, on the United States' part, do you think it'll take to overcome the kind of determination that this individual and this and the many like him uh, really feel, which drives them onward, which drives them to do exceptionally dangerous things sometimes just for a very meager subsistence living here? How much can we really do to dissuade them? Now, we hear a bunch of people chanting, oh, we need a border wall, and we need biometric checks, and we need more guards, and all this shit. If there's one thing the war on drugs should have taught us by now, it's that those who are making a profession of smuggling things across the border, they're very creative, they're very clever, and that the authorities who are combating them will always be playing a game of catch-up. Now, if this is the case, what do you think is the more likely scenario? Should we have a massive border wall and tight-ass border security? What do you think is the more likely case? That those who are trying to come here will simply give up and say, well, they beat us this time, can't get over that wall. Or do you think they'll just do what the drug smugglers have done? Get more creative, maybe even find the cottage niche industry of the coyote expanding into a larger cartel run operation. My money's on the ladder there. For some reason, I don't really see a bunch of people who would face death just to get here to do menial jobs, seeing a wall and some attitudes and more guys in uniform is necessarily going to stop them. And even if you do stop an incre you know, a, a bigger portion of those crossing than we do now, you're still dealing with the kinds of people who are going to find new ways around that, and then they'll have backup plans for when you discover those. Now to some, this may sound like I'm either a defeatist, or maybe I'm just pro-illegal immigration. Maybe I am one of those borderless, one-world nutjobs. But to them, I'd point out, no. To them, I would point out that it wasn't until I actually began considering these questions that I began really pondering actual ways that could potentially, in theory, address this situation. Now, one such theory, one such idea that I've sort of come up with thus far has been something of a service for citizenship arrangement. Now, there are, are already programs similar to this now which allow for military enlistment for you know, certain people that will allow them to get sort of a, a head start in getting that citizenship they so desperately crave. But I, for one, think that programs like this, for one thing, ought to be expanded. Make military service a path to citizenship for more people. And at the same time, for those who are maybe not set for military service, why don't we recognize what it is that we're so frequently dealing with, which aside from the lines from the hard right, for instance, which I like to call them an invading army, why don't we consider instead that they're actually a veritable army of ready and willing laborers, people who will do whatever they're asked for next to nothing in return, in terms of pay, who will do whatever is asked so long as they can have a shot at the American dream. Now, if this is the case, I can't see why things like crisis management and crisis response, disaster response, it wouldn't be the perfect place for a small army of very motivated people who, by and large, and I may be speaking in stereotypes here, seem oftentimes rather talented with basic carpentry. Hmm, maybe that's an idea. Maybe another idea is we actually use them for real foreign aid. Now, oftentimes we hear all this shit about how foreign aid's bleeding us dry and how foreign aid's bad and this and that, but not many people really go into the whys and hows of that. Now, that'll be a different video, but for the time being, right here, right now, I'll say that most foreign aid packages, as they're offered around the world, aren't really so much using a given nation's tax dollars to directly help and benefit the people who are affected by blights such as poverty, disease, war, famine. As much as they are really sort of schemes, investment schemes, to get these countries that were interested in helping to open up their natural resources to what are usually boards of corporations who've helped broker these and establish these deals to begin with, that are designed to fail, so that then, just like with the IMF, we could turn around, put more conditions, demand that they open up more of their resources, give exclusive contracts to certain corporations, so on and so forth. Oh, and by the way, we don't really like what your neighbors are up to, we're gonna need you to help us out with some regime change. Shit like this. But if we were to dedicate ourselves to a genuine humanitarian service, and we were actually perhaps staffing this with people who were found capable and willing, and who would do so in perhaps, let's say, a two-year term of service in exchange for citizenship for them and their immediate families. Well, that sounds like a plan, doesn't it? Now again, these are all just ideas and theories. I haven't sat around with a think tank or a congressional panel trying to really study and figure out exactly how they'd work, and they might not work at all. 
But one thing I can be certain of is that if the old lines of let's let them all in or versus let's kick them all out are going to continue to be the only two dominant narratives in the questions of immigration and illegal immigration, we can expect more of the same, which is ultimately more illegal immigration, less actual tangible work to deal with the situation, and then a whole bunch of people screaming at each other while they find another 50-yard line they can drive that political football down towards. These are just some of my ideas, some notions I had. Because I believe that if we don't actually analyze the situation objectively for what it is, beyond just whether or not they're breaking the law, or this land is my land, or this is the land of opportunity, if we're going to speak to each other in taglines and buzzwords, well then there's no point in talking about it at all. Because until we can actually first address in real and find a way to actually exploit the deep and powerful motivations that so many of these people have, if we can find a way to take these people who will risk life and limb just to hide in some shitty apartment while they're cooking your food or building your fucking parents' sunroom, until we can find a way to actually harness and exploit that kind of motivation and we're going to continue banging our heads against a metaphorical wall, either in hopes of getting a wall or knocking it down, nothing's going to get better. These are just my thoughts. As usual, I am curious to hear what yours are. Now leave a comment down below. Like and subscribe. Leave a comment. Share with your friends. All that good shit. I'm selling t-shirts and iPhone cases. Links down below. Patreon link down below. Paypal.me down below if you want to support the channel. Those are some ways to do it. Catch me on YouTube Saints on Sundays. On YouTube at the channel of the same name. That'll usually about 10.30ish Eastern Time. Also, Wednesdays or Thursdays, we do a midweek stream on Twitch. I don't even have the link for that, but I'll find it. At any rate, y'all know the drill. Thanks for stopping by. It's been fun, and I'll see you next time. Get the fuck out of my living room. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster, and treat those two imposters just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves, to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to, broken, and stoop, and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and talks, and lose and start again in your beginnings, and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they're gone, and so hold on when there's nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on.